Oh, my heart is a very good morning to you. And dinky do, it's just me, Scotty McClure, first lord of the internet and the world's top broadcaster, saying a very good morning to you. Welcome to our morning live stream. And uh, I would just like to uh, see who's about, of course, and have a good old chit chat with you. Excellent stuff. And uh, who have we got joining us? My goodness me. Cameron Filson, lovely to have you with us, and Dinky Doo from me, Scotty McClue. Very interesting thing happening there. Uh, well, it wasn't interesting. It was uh, it was quite strange. I was just about to come and broadcast to you, and um, the camera went upside down. So I didn't think you would fancy an hour of McClue standing in his head. It's probably difficult enough with me the right way up. <laughs> so there we are. That's what we're doing. Numpty head. Scotty, dinky do. There's Lloyd Duff in Australia. Welcome, Lloyd. Lovely to have you with us. Stephen Mulgrew is watching. Welcome, Stephen. Morning, Scott, and dinky do, says Kevin Stewart. Jack says dinky do, Scotty. Good morning, Jack. Jack down in Greenock there. Dinky do, Mr. McClue, says Cameron. Hello, Cameron. Welcome, welcome, welcome to our morning live stream. One of the many things I love about these live streams, you just don't know who's going to join you. There's no kind of rhyme or reason about it. As I say, the other day, we had several thousand. Uh, okay, in Australia, says Kevin, did you do? And uh, that's fantastic. Uh, watching in Oz. And uh, Willie Drysdale, you've just joined us. Lloyd says, Dinky do, it sounds like something I say as I tip my cap. Even the English were gobsmacked when I do that. You say, like, ah, Dinky do to you. Yes, a good morning. It's a wonderful, wonderful catchphrase. And it served me well for the last 28 years in June. Uh, the camera being upside down uh, would be okay in Oz, says Kevin. <laughs> Kevin, I like your banter and your humor. Very, very good. Uh, there's Cam from Lossie Mouth. I know Lossie Mouth well. Have you got beautiful weather in Lossie Mouth this morning? The harbor will be looking lovely. The silver sands, the lighthouse. There's the old bridge open, all that. See, I know my Lossie Mouth, you know. Yes, yes, I'm not just an athlete and a handsome face. Uh, good morning, Scotty McClure. This is Derek Walker. Thank you, Derek. Scotty, scary times now. Uh, underworld going crazy. We're on the brink of gorilla warfare over there. My dad's native country, Sicily. Oh, so there you are, Sicily, El Salvador. So you're uh, a Sicilian. How fantastic is that? Michael Clark, Christopher Mosley, a Sicilian in Salford. We like that. Christopher Mosley, lovely to have you with us. A gentleman, if ever I met one. Um, well, we haven't met, but we're Facebook chums. So there we are. Um, bridge still closed? Yes, absolutely. I can remember we had a very interesting exchange about uh, Repton. Repton School, um, where they had uh, Archbishop William Temple. Uh, I think he was uh, uh, an old Reptonian, and uh, have I got that right? And uh, also um, Geoffrey Francis Fisher, Archbishop Fisher, who uh, was around when uh, when the Queen was crowned. Do you agree with the new policy measures that have been put in place for people who were coughing on purpose in people's faces? Oh, Jack, yes, I mean, there was somebody spat at a policeman the other day and got jailed for a long time, quite right. There we are. Uh, any idiots, get them off the streets, get them away. Um, build new jails as well as new hospitals. You know, that's the sort of idea. Convert places into jails. If we've got any crims rearing their ugly heads during the lockdown. Uh, Russell Robertson, I think you do. Lovely to have you with us. You've aged, says Russell Robertson. Overnight, yes. No doubt I have. Um, I was on last night at 10 o'clock sharp, and this morning I've aged. El Salvador Stelioni, lol. Uh, Ian Kerr's watching, thank you, dear. Morning, sir. Beautiful weather today in the Shire. I hope people stay at home. Let's stay safe. 
Which shire are you in, Michael? Do tell. Lorraine's watching. Lorraine Harrison, thank you do. Lovely to have you with us. Kevin Stewart, meant to talk about the ferries to the Isles. Used to work on the Isle of Butte. The Glen Sanex was the ferry from Wims Bay to Rossi. Yes, yeah, it was built in 1957 at Eels, a shipbuilding yard. And um, the Glen Sanex, Captain Hutchison. Wonderful stuff, Captain Hutchison. Um, I uh, still hear from his daughter on Facebook. And um, the Glen Sanex was also the Aran boat, hence Glen Sanex. And I think she would be either the second of the third Glen Sanex. So there you are, that used to, uh, used to apply to Aaron. Very nice, Aaron. Good morning, Aaron. Uh, Licata in Sicily to Salford. We've had it hard, but we've made it. Absolutely, you have, Salvador. Uh, good morning, Scotty. Dinky do, Noreen says. I've aged overnight, apparently. Wouldn't be surprised. Um, the wife got new clothes. Withdrawal says Derek Walker. The wife's got new clothes withdrawal. <laughs> we love it. Share, please, everybody. Not an old reptorian. An old reptile, says <laughs> Kevin. What are you at, Kevin? Gordon Hadley, dinky-doo. Peter Connolly, dinky-doo. Lovely hymn tune, Repton. Anybody know it? There we are. See, I, I know these stuff. As I see, I'm not just an athlete. A black belt in karaoke. Yes. Now then, Peter Conley's joined us. Wonderful. Johnny Garvey. Sid Harris, what happens after lockdown? Will it not just start again when we go back out? I can't see an end to it. Well, Sid, it depends what it actually is. We've got a name for it, but we don't really know what it actually is. So that's the impression. I get maybe I'm being naive and somebody knows exactly what it actually is. I'm just sharing here, guys. If you can all do the same, that would be outstanding. Anybody thrown a little bit by the hour this morning? Because effectively it's nine o'clock. It's ten past nine, isn't it? Um, so there's an answer. Anybody answer that one? What happens when we go out after lockdown? Kevin Stewart says your knowledge is great. Oh, I don't know about that, Kevin. I like to answer what I can. Uh, put the crims on a remote Scottish island and let them fend for themselves. Um, I'm in South Lanarkshire. Oh, Michael, I don't know that we want to put them in South Lanarkshire. I don't know that the crims would, uh, they'd want the crims and the gow and, uh, and all of that, and Straven and all that sort of stuff. But uh, I suppose... I'm thinking there's only Rock All. Um, that's an island, by the way, um, not a, a, an expression of speech. There's only Rock All. I'm trying to think of remote Scottish islands. Um, the Sheant Islands are quite remote, but I don't know if there's enough room for crims. I don't think anybody lives on the Sheants, which uh, used to be owned by Nigel Nicholson, the author. Um, and, well, the writer, the publishers. Andrew Clark, thank you, do, Gio Lotus. Moira, Chico's mum's watching. Thank you, do, Moira. How is Chico today? Do tell, spill the beans. My wife's credit card is wondering why it's been made redundant, says Peter Connolly. <laughs> That's wonderful, isn't it? Ah... Lorraine says, shared. Great, Lorraine. Thank you. Share, 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 share. Share, 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 share. Wonderful. So there we are. Am I looking a bit strange here? Are we at the right angle and everything? I have to look to the side to see all the writing. What job did you have when you were a teenage boy? When I was a teenage boy, Jack Mellies, I worked on the boats, on the Liberty boats, I worked on a boat called the Granny Kempuk. I worked on a boat called the Gorokian, which was formerly the Ashton. And I worked on a boat called the Westering Home. And they were all based at that little pier at Cardwell Bay, which is now in disuse. That used to be very, very, very busy because there was a big American ship in the Holy Loch. 
And uh, we used to go, so whenever he went to football and rugby, well, I went to rugby as well, but I would uh, cycle home and change into my jeans and jumper, and I would rush down to Cardwell Bay and go on board the Liberty Boats. They are wonderful. i would get to steer them and everything. Well, apparently, there's 1,228 dead. Rest in peace. The angels have them now. Absolutely, Lorraine Harrison. Bless them. So there we are. Good morning, Scotty. How are you this fine day? Tell the nation, what did you have for breakfast? I hope it was something healthy. Well, Johnny Garvey, uh, it was actually healthy. It was fresh tomatoes, thinly sliced on um, brown seeded bread with a little bit of coleslaw and a tiny, tiny amount of virgin olive oil. So there we are. What about that for breakfast? Two slices. Fred Walters watching. Dinky do. James McDonald. Dinky do. A little bit of salt in the tomato. Uh, Tony the Bartler was down at the job centre last week. He's unemployed now, says Derek Walker. <clears throat> do you know that you shouldn't smoke in your house because if a burglar breaks in, it's his workplace. So there you are. That's a thought, isn't it? Angela Brown, I, I, I made that up, actually. Uh, they used to be gossiping women on an island in Loch Lomond. They used to put gossiping women on an island in Loch Lomond to teach them a lesson, says the wonderful Kevin Stewart. Perhaps we should go back to that and put the gossiping women on an island in Loch Lomond to teach them a lesson. But do they not just gossip to each other when you put them on the island? That's what I need to do. <laughs> Wonderful Neil Allgate's watching. Cameron Filson, do you miss the old days who used to have heated debates on the radio? Well, of course. I mean, I'm sure it could come back, but it's convincing. Uh, you see, radio stations have become very lazy and they become a little bit on the greedy side. And also it's become a very, very tough gig running a radio station. So what happened? They've put all the local radio stations together, bought them and bought them and bought them and bought them until there's just two big groups. And then they've decided just to treat them as jukeboxes because young people now don't really need a radio or television station and there's nothing different on it. There's not what we call a USP, a unique selling point. And Scotty McClure on the radio is a unique selling point. So people will join that radio station for the phone in. And that's why I was very lucky. I was very successful right across central Scotland, across the northwest of England, across the Midlands, across Yorkshire, across the northeast of England. Scotty McClure's audience is through the roof all the time simply because we were different. So there you are. Um, so yes, from that point of view, fantastic stuff. But then again, Scotty McClure is coming up to 28 years in June. So to say, do you miss it? You think, well, I, I, I did it. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's a bit like the wonderful Florence Foster Jenkins um, on her deathbed. She said, people might have said I couldn't sing, but they can't say I didn't. So, you know, people can criticize Scotty McClure as much as you like, but they can't say I haven't had 28 fabulous years to date on radio and television. Uh, I thought you walked in the Titanic, says Kevin Stewart. No, the Titanic. Very, very interesting. What position did you play at at rugby? I used to be a winner myself. Uh, Stephen Menzies, I was tight head prop and um, I was second row. Uh, I was a forward, you see. I'm here, Scotty, says Angela Brown. Thank you, Angela. Lovely to have you with us and welcome. Fantastic. Johnny Garvey. No, Scotty, that doesn't sound very good. A bacon roll with brown sauce. That's the thing to start the day. Just as well you mentioned that, JG, because I had the bacon roll with brown sauce 
on Saturday. And yesterday it was such a joke. So there we are. Never a dull moment. I know how to eat. I was uh, reading on Facebook yesterday. Some people think Boris having coronavirus is a publicity stunt. How pathetic. Whether you like him or not, he's doing a good job. The alternative to be elected, says Peter Connolly. Um... The alternative elected, and I won't name them, would have been like asking Birkin here to look after your gravestone. I don't think I agree, Peter Connolly, simply because the mainstream media managed to influence everybody um, in that. And if you look at the opposition, they very, very nearly... Now, as they used to say, nearly never killed the man, but um, they very nearly won the last election. So we're dealing with the most popular Labour leader ever. Very interesting. But the mainstream media are petrified of this country going left wing. There is no way under the sun, the moon and the stars that new Labour could have been called left wing. Right? So there you are. They became the party of war and um, couldn't really have gone much further to the right, I don't think. So there we go. But they were under the label. But this country likes to keep to the right. Yes, they are absolutely scared stiff of socialism, which I think is a throw a throwback to the Russian Revolution. They saw socialists as communists. And if you look back at some politicians um, who are just kind of middle of the road now, you'll see that some of them had a connection with communism when they were younger. Um, so Tony the Butler had a crowd fund page last week. <laughs> Stop. Uh, Robert Rovers, good morning, Scotty. I think you do. Lovely to have you with us. Have we all shared? Get sharing. I'm just going to share to my story. Let everybody know we're on. You can have the most fantastic show in the world. But if people don't know you're on, you know, I don't know. The name of the jetty where the American boat was birthed was Glen Mallon. Peter Connolly, the American boat wasn't birthed at a jetty. It was stuck in the middle of the Holy Loch, anchored. So there you go. Good morning, Scotty. A special dinky-doo to everyone who's watching on Cameo. Fred Walton, dinky-doo with your Cameo. Excellent stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Now then, Ian McDougall's watching. Good morning, Ian. You will be very sleepy. You'll not be used to being about at this time. Good morning, McClure. Good morning, Ian. Lovely to have you with us. Thoroughly enjoy your banter and our debates. So there we are. You're a wee bit misinformed, but hopefully I've helped there a lot. Uh, Gordon Stirling and Annie Donald. Thank you, good morning, Scotty. Thank you, this is Johnny Grimley. John Grimley, lovely to have you with us. Appreciate it. Scotty, good morning, says Gordon Stirling. Good morning. Gordon Stirling is made of proper stuff. Absolute gent. There we are. Does a bit of everything. Seems to drive a bus, restore a bus. He's got a huge business uh, dealing in second-hand bus seats, which, of course, everybody should have in their house. Um, he... Uh, he knows about engines, he knows about vehicles, he knows about bagpipes, bagpipe tunes. There we are. He helps Agnes with her bunions. Just a top man. Uh, Numpty Head, are you taking Skype calls this morning, Scotty? Numpty Head, if it's you, we can always manage a wee Skype call. So let me just see if we're set up for Skype. So that's what we'll do. There we go. Yes. Try it, Numpty Head. 
and we shall see if we can uh, get a call from you. Gordon Roberts is watching. Good morning, Gordon. Thank you for all your wonderful support. I agree with what you say about Labour, Scotty. I just think instead of slagging the Prime Minister off, we should get behind him in these uncertain times. I think everybody has got behind him. But that Brexit thing was a, a sheer embarrassment. We should never, ever, ever, ever have contemplated coming out of the EU, you know, and all that in which democracy, they really had to pull a few strokes to uh, to get that through the House of Commons. So there you are. And three of the countries, four countries, are being wrenched out of Europe, which we'd built up. It's our EU. Together with Germany, we controlled over 30% of the whole market. 28 countries, 510 million people, all gone at a stroke because of a handful of hooray Henrys and a few wee xenophobes waving a five-penny flag. Ooh, all that sort of stuff. Uh, Tony the burglar stole all my lamps. I should be upset, but I'm delighted. <laughs> Jack says, do you think we could be turning back to rationing soon? I wondered about that. The little, I think I've still got a ration book in the house. Not that it would be valid now. And people can um, take out the little coupons. I think they might have had a wee tool that pulled them out. They were like little stamps. I'll see if I can find it and show it to you. Second World War rationing. Gordon Stilling, daily exercise. Should not include a car journey. Please, Scotland, say the emphasis is on persuasion and enforcement as the last resort. God help us. Absolutely. Deo gracias, Gordon. Now, Fred Walton. Scotty, do you think the five million being spent on sending the PM's letter added to our daily mountain of junk mail? Would it not be much better spent on buying protective equipment for the NHS staff? Well, I think one of the reasons they would have sent the letter is because, uh, I mean, we're not really big on mail now, we email. But one of the reasons they would have sent the letter is they couldn't be sure that everybody's watching the telly because a lot of people, particularly young people, don't watch television. They choose to watch Scotty McClue on Facebook Live, on YouTube, on Twitter, that sort of stuff. And a lot of people are actually watching me instead of television because it's just different and it relates to real people. You know, so I think that's the big attraction of Scotty McClure. So sending out the letter, people might not have seen the tele adverts. You know, when the medical officers come up with a lang face, and tell you to wash your hands, to stay in the house. All that sort of stuff. Very sound advice, but not everybody might see it. So a wee letter. But I agree that a lot of these letters will end up uh, in the dump. <coughs> but as long as they've been read first, it makes sense. Everything they're telling us makes sense. The questions that might be asked if all this clears up is, did our government do the right thing at the right time. That will be the judgment because there was talk of herd immunity, let everybody get it, we'll be fine. Then that changed, no, stop. Vault face, about turn. Michael Yule's watching, good Lord Scotty. Have you had a bump in the head? You're actually talking sense for a moment. New Labour has indeed abandoned its roots. There's hope for you and me, old chum. Listen, I tweeted that Labour in Scotland, because they were anti-independence, um, that was their worst mistake ever. That speech made by a former Prime Minister and a former Chancellor about don't go independent, um, that clobbered Labour completely. They killed off their own party. They threw out the baby with the bath water. That was the end of Labour. And um, they shouldn't have done that and had Labour backed Scottish independence. If I'd been the head of the Scottish Labour Party, I would have rung headquarters in London and said, listen, uh, Scotty McClure here, just to let you know, 
I'm making a big political decision. We're going to cast you adrift. We're going with independence. And kept right up beside the SNP. Labour would have probably been in power in Scotland now. So you've got to say, do you listen to the people or do you abandon your roots? Because the roots of the Labour Party are very closely entwined with the roots of the Scottish National Party. And I think the word national is maybe the one that throws everybody because nationalists tend to be right wing. In Scotland, the nationalists are just to the left of centre, I would say. So that's the whole thing. So if it was just the Scottish party, you know, and I might yet start a new one myself, you know, we'll have to talk about all that. But if it was um, the Scottish party and Labour had stuck in there, it was the chairman of the Labour party at the time who started the SNP. You see, people don't read their history books. And the problem with the SNP over the years was clarity. There were splits in it. The Scottish Covenant, all that sort of stuff. If you go back, if you read uh, John McCormick, Flag in the Wind, about really when it was at its power. And what was interesting, they said, the biggest political meeting ever in Scotland took place in the St Andrews Halls when over 3,000 people turned up. Now, I popped up on Facebook the other day and nearly 6,000 people turned up. Does that put things in proportion? Does that tell you what's going on? So I then remember tweeting that Labour will remain in the wilderness until they make it clear that they are the party of independence that would support independence in Scotland and also they should have made it clear about Europe. So when uh, the right had let's get Brexit done, if I'd been in charge of the left at the time, and I'm apolitical, I don't go in for politics. If I'd been in charge of the left at the time, I would have said our slogan is let's get Brexit dumped. And we get a hold of the old papers and we go and see the editors and say, will you back us? But newspapers have gone like television and radio stations. They've allowed themselves to be bought up by rich people. And rich people say, no, 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 I need to, I need to back the right here. I don't want any lefty wefty nonsense. You know, that sort of idea. And what we need in this country, you'll only get really good government when you have a really strong opposition snapping at their heels. So there you are, leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword and fire, crouch for employment. What's that from? Henry V, the prologue to Shakespeare's Henry V. Good Lord, Scotty. Uh, <laughs> Ian McDougall's beside himself with joy. He's found a chum in Scotty McLoon. <coughs> Don't worry about the cough, had it for 20 years. Scotty, there's a boat upside down and water at Helensburgh. Can you tell me what is this? Um, an old sugar boat. Upside down in the water, Johnny, that is the Captianus. And I can't remember exactly when it was, maybe 1972 or something like that. And there was a big storm. She was moored. She was anchored not far from where she's lying off the tail of the bank. And she dragged her moorings. She dragged her anchor and got herself in the bank and she capsized. And uh, hopefully, if I remember right, they got the crew off. And she was in perfect nick. I've been out in my own little boat and had a look round the wreck in my time. I don't have my own little boat now, but, you know, I've been out and had a good look at her and she's lying, big, big thing. But she does spoil the um, the view there and it would have been quite good if they'd uh, blown her up, uh, you know, but they then need to mark where the wreck is. 
The only other thing would have been to have, um, um, you know, oxyacetylene burned all the steel and taken her away, but that would cost fortunes. So there you are. Then there's the whole law of salvage and everything. Anyway, she can't be salvaged now. Jeff Bernstein, Dinky Do. Did you hear about the time the Navy fired a test torpedo from a sub and locked it onto a bread van, followed it all the way up Arica Road and came out the water at the top of Loch Long? A true story. I did hear about the time the wee ferry was going across to Coltreggan and had the radio open and they heard them say, um, they were doing a practice and they said, lock on to target. And this is the, they were just practicing. But the skipper of the ferry got a bit of a shock, I think. Alistair Hunter, dinky do. Lovely to have you with us. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Right, have we done any sharing at all? Or have we all been very lax? Yes, we don't seem to be getting the figures up. So uh, share to our page. I'll share to the Scotty McClure page. Tell them all we're live now. Fantastic stuff. How's everybody this morning? Are we dinky do? Do you like the morning pop-up? Do let me know. Give me feedback. I also agree 100% about Brexit, Scotty. The biggest mistake in our country's history. Yes, there are certain things. I mean, I used to not be pro the EU, um, you know, because I saw the fishing ports going to decline. Big fishing ports like Oban, Campbelltown, Tarbert, Stornoway, that sort of idea. But then I realized that the money flowing into the country from Europe, that's how we've got all our motorways, our infrastructure, everything. You're actually better together. No country can really survive purely on its own. So if Scotland was going independent, this, there's so many uh, arguments, this answers here. We were nearly bust when we begged to get into Europe. And uh, President de Gaulle, Charles de Gaulle, said no, no to the roast beefs. So Britain was just about to go down the swanee because we'd beggared ourselves in two world wars. And what people also don't realize, old Winnie, uh, they were contemplating surrendering in 1940. There's a meeting in 1940 when uh, Chamberlain was still the PM and they were contemplating surrender. If we surrendered, would we actually, would they let us keep India and the Royal Navy? So that was what was on the go. So the appeasement movement, and they were later denounced as traitors, which was shocking. The appeasement movement, who consisted a lot of the aristocracy, because a lot of people were very interested in Germany and in Hitler, and what he was achieving before the truth had come out and what was going on behind the scenes. So, uh, you know, but they didn't trust Hitler. Robert Boothby went to see him. It was a very funny story that. I, I've always found that a funny story. Boothby was shown into this huge, massive hall where Hitler was sitting at a desk at the end. And um, Hitler jumped up and went, Hitler! And Robert Boothby went, Boothby! So there you go. Um, I used to be young people, Scotty, says Lee Marsden. Didn't we all? Scotty, you're good mate. Um, that's good to see you, says Alistair. Excellent. So what was I going to tell you? So we begged to get into Europe and then we built it and built it and built it up to be very successful. And then, um, these people have pulled four countries out of this massive union, economic union, three of the countries against their will. So I think we'll find that Brexit was a massive, massive error of judgment. So there we are. But uh, it was up to the left to build themselves. Jack says, I'm a young teenage boy. I watch the news. It's very informative. Yes, but Jack, you're a highly intelligent young teenage boy. And you will always look for information, and that's fabulous. That's what I did when I was your age. <coughs> Janice Muldoon, good morning. Scotty, good morning, Janice. Mwah. 
Henry Anderson's watching, dinky do. The lovely Susan Forrest, dinky do. Thomas Hamilton, good morning, pal. Jeff Bernstein, you're spot on regarding Labour, Scotty. They're not even at the races in Scotland anymore. One of the reasons because their resistance regarding independence. We should bring back Glenn Michael's cavalcade. Uh, he always brought a sense of calm. Loved Glenn Michael and terrific guy. Um, as far as I know, still around and was performing um, well into uh, to, uh, to later life. Fantastic, because I think I remember him saying he, you know, he couldn't be bothered sitting around. He wanted to work. So there we are. Loved it. Glenn Michaels, cartoon cavalcade. What was the wee dog called? Was it Rusty? You had a wee dog. I remember that. And of course, I worked at Scottish television, and I used to see Glenn. Fantastic. Craig Pardy, dinky-doo. Susan Forrest, good morning, Scotty. Morning, Susan. James Watrett is watching. Peter Connolly is watching. The boat on its side just off Ardmore Point was trying to get into the Tate and Lyle factory in Greenock. Everybody was rescued, and it's been left on the sandbank as a warning. The Captianus, Peter Connolly, good stuff. There used to be a big three-masted schooner, on the rocks over around, um, trying to think where she was. Was it Cove or was it Sandbank? But you could see, I could see it from the house. In the morning, you got your binoculars, you could see this big old three-masted schooner up in the rocks. And then she was refloated. She used to sit at Danoon for a long time. Tony Max watching. Good morning. Darren Christie. Those who do not learn history are doomed to repeat it, Kevin Stewart. I salute you, sir. Yes, a dear old friend of mine just passed away, and he um, was with the Argyle and Southern Highlanders the night they went into Crater with Colin Mitchell. And um, in a documentary, he said, I don't think politicians read their history books. They don't learn from the past, and they should. That's what should be taught. Um, it's wonderful. The, the, the wonderful Gordonston School where Prince Philip and Prince Charles went and the rest of the royal family, not Princess Anne, she didn't go there, but um, she was very heavily involved with Gordonston School. And that was started by a gentleman called Kurt Hahn, who was Jewish, and he was imprisoned by Hitler. And he brought his school over to uh, the old Gordonston estate in Murrayshire, in 1934, and the school was um, Salem School had been started by, I think it was Prince Philip's uncle, who wanted to educate world leaders. He was a prince, and um, he wanted to educate world leaders because they didn't want what had happened in the First World War to happen again. So there you go, wonderful. And I would like to educate politicians. I might start a school for politicians. You've given me an idea, absolutely, of which English and history, if it's British politicians, um, or their own language, so languages and history and geography and mathematics and arithmetic would be the main subjects. Yes, you've given me an idea, guys. I was wondering what to do with the rest of my time on earth. And it's just happened through Scotty McClure Live. The Politician's School. Uh, yes, there was a large eugenics movement in the world during the 1930s. Well, Kevin Stewart, if you take a look at Europe in the 1930s, there was trouble in almost every country. France, Germany, after the very punitive measures of the First World War, from the Treaty of Versailles in 1919. Too punitive, right? Germany was trying to rebuild. That's how Hitler was allowed to get to power. So, trouble in Germany, trouble in France, trouble in Spain, Franco, the Republicans fighting, the Spanish Civil War, trouble in uh, Czechoslovakia, right? Huge problems there. Uh, trouble in Albania, all across Europe, trouble in Poland, trouble in the UK in the 1930s, massive slump, trouble in America, 
the Wall Street crash, you know, the general strike 1926. Um, so there was all sorts of things going on. McClure, can you take a breath and let the audience have a shot, please? Gordon Stirling, what are you talking about? You can come on any time. I've got Skype here. You can Skype me and phone me live on this program. So don't start. There we are. Scotty, and a wee memory the other night. Do you remember when you were at the Cumbernauld Theatre? I was there, and it was fabulous. I can remember you got a big lassie on, and she was giving you a run for your money. Uh, yes, she was indeed. Um, those were great days, my friend. You need to do this again. It would go down a storm. Give it a thought. I'm sure you would fill the place. No problem. It's a thought, a live show with Scotty McClue. Would you all come? Uh, I met Glenn Michael at Somerset Park in Ayr, a lovely gentleman, says Robert Rovers. He is indeed. Uh, it was founded by Kurt Hahn. Yes, Kurt Hahn, and Kurt was Jewish, and he was also uh, the first housemaster. So there you are at Gordonston. Uh, Kira Murphy is watching. He was a wonderful educationist, way before his time, inclusion. There was a wee boy who had polio, and he would get the seniors to carry this wee boy down to the canteen every morning, and um, every day was to go and have a chat. You know, very important. Total inclusion, very advanced educational thinking. He would ask about the sports. How did everybody get on at sports on Saturday? And they would say... He, um, the first 15 won. I'm not interested. I want to know how the little ones are progressing. So that was him, Cut Hand. Wonderful man. Used to go to Brown's Hotel in London and he would have several meetings running at the one time. Benefactors, parents, prospective parents, politicians, whoever he had to see, he would, um, he would pop out. He would say, so this is what I think. You must excuse me. I have another meeting next door. And uh, that wonderful, wonderful Gordon Roddick's watching. Scotty, you're making me feel much better through this pandemic, says Jack. Bless you, Jack. Great stuff. Thank you for all your uh, support on YouTube. Scotty, did you know Glenn uh, Michael's born in Devon? Although we all thought he was a Scotsman, he's still with us. And he's 93 years old, an incredible man. Bless him, Peter Connolly. Well, he was my era. When I worked at Scottish Television, which is uh, 35 years ago, so he would be 57. Wow, there we go. So if you can still look up Scottish Television, you can see old newscasts and stuff like that. Fantastic. Now, how are we doing for time? My goodness, doesn't time fly when you're having fun? It's a quarter to 11, quarter to lemon. And um, what I would like you to do, keep sharing, I must share. You know, there's going to be a very small amount have watched this this morning because we haven't been sharing. So nobody knows it's on. I'm going, oh, when was Scotty on? I'd have watched that. There we go. Wonderful stuff. Right. Share, share. Live now. Just tell them straight. Live now. There we are. Do you like the pop-ups, guys? Do tell me. How's this working? I've got this old computer here and it's so slow. So when all this is over and everybody's flush, somebody will maybe donate me a fast computer I'll try it again. No, it's not typing. Right, okay, that's fair enough. What I'll do, maybe the, I'll just share it anyway. Right, that's it, and they can decide. Give us a tune, please, McClue. Ah, Kevin, I was going to set you up the piano. Love the pop-ups, Scotty, keep them going. Uh, I was gonna set you up the piano, yeah, but we must get sharing, guys. Can everybody share with every group, every person? 
Right, get sharing right now, seriously. Fantastic. Uh, love the pop-ups. Yes, good, good, good. There we are. Are we just about the right angle, guys? Oh, I don't want that to go. Uh, one of my English colleges asked me yesterday if there was an alcohol ban in Scotland. I don't buy it, but I'm not aware of any such thing. Imagine the riots of the government brought that rule in. Oh, we'd get, uh, what what was it called? Um, prohibition. When they prohibited drink. It's an idea. I mean, I gave up booze. Not for any great reason other than um, I wanted to be able to drive any time of the day or night. Uh, so I just decided and I couldn't do all that calculation with so how many units and how many hours and and the problem is that in the old days, uh, you know, if you were stopped for drink driving, you got a fine or you got a warning. You know, if you went far, you're just over the limit. But now you're a major crim. So you might have just, oh, a sip or two too much. And um, you're a major criminal. You know, it's that sort of idea. You lose your job and all that kind of stuff. That's not going to happen. There's too much money made from it. There was a guy who used to phone me. And he was very keen on dance halls. And he, he used to blame officialdom for closing the dance halls. And he, he was a very interesting man, actually, although I, I wouldn't like him to hear me say that. Because I used, we used to go uh, lock horns and go hammer and tongs. And uh, a wee bit of argy bargy. And uh, the interesting thing, what he used to say was, you can't actually make a living out of alcohol alone it doesn't stack up and just to illustrate that look at before they shut the pubs <laughs> officialdom i think would love to shut pubs anyway because it means people can go there and talk and loosen their tongue and have a good old blether about the government and everything they would rather you did it online and then they can see what you've said and everything, because it's all there, it's all recorded. Uh, Scotty, do you not think this pandemic will bring more crime with it? Well, it might, Jack. They'll need to keep an eye. You see, the Tories cut 20,000 police officers, and now they're talking about we're going to reinstate 20,000 police officers. You see, politicians are given a certain budget, and they can shave a bit off here and put a bit on there. They can play with it. But the big players are your permanent government, the civil service. That's why I said at the time when uh, a, a major politician was slagging off the civil service, I thought, never, ever, ever get into a fight with the civil service. It's professional death for a politician, right? Because the civil service are wonderful and they know what they're doing. Like any organization, there will be flaws, but they're also 100% honest. And there was a very senior politician once said to his uh, senior civil servant, his mandarin, he said, you know this morning, he discovered he had offshore funds. And he said, you know this morning when I said in the meeting, I had no offshore funds. Um, well, I do, but can you say that I don't. And the civil servant said, no. He said, why not? He said, because you do. Yeah, but can you say that I don't? He said, no, because you do. And it went on like that because it was all in the notes. And the senior civil servant said, you know, you've got to honest yourself up here. And I think that's a bit of a shock for politicians who perhaps tell the odd tiny wee whites, no, I can't say that, who perhaps occasionally might misconstrue the truth. See what I just did there? That sort of idea. And I think that that's where the civil service come in and go, no, 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 we need to get the facts out there. You know, so there's a lot of, oh, for goodness sake, don't tell them that. Uh, but Scotland, the SNP have increased police numbers. Yes, Gordon Robertson. I mean, regardless of what your politics are, 
The SNP have never put a foot wrong in Scotland. And I think that a lot of the people in uh, the rest of Great Britain, which is a landmass, the other four countries, wish that they had people of the calibre of who's leading Scotland leading them. You know, I mean, it's, it's just this was all shown up during Brexit, you know. Uh, so there we are. There's no doubt that we've been well governed. Um, uh, the self-employed in this country are really suffering. My mates are burglar and can't find any empty houses. <laughs> Stop. There we are. Uh, we, Alex, uh, oh, yes. Yes, I've done Scotland proud, says um, Gordon Robertson. So there you are. Yes, he's saying that the first ministers of Scotland have done Scotland proud. Um, the only thing I would say about Scotland is I would like Scotland to have a go at keeping its own money, you know, to get everything back on track. There's a lot of want in Scotland, and we need Scotland to be there as an absolute example as to how a country should be run. And if we kept our own money or kept it for a while or kept more of it, then we could uh, eradicate a lot of the want in Scotland. And I would like to see that. And I would like to see towns like Greenock and Dumbarton and Paisley and Kilmarnock and um, Motherwell and Hamilton and Coatbrig, all these towns back to full capacity, all the villages throughout Scotland, too many to name right here, but I would like to see all that back to capacity. So there we go. I bet the sorry making so many cuts to the NHS and the police. Uh, yes, they will be. They shouldn't have done that. They screwed it right down. Of course, there's going to be money to bandy about if you've cut the public services, you know, and that's what uh, the right like to do. I'm not putting labels on the parties. The right like to uh, give all the money to the rich and the left like to give all the money to the poor. Um, that's the extremities of it. And then there's a bit of a grey area in between. But that was why people, I think, were shocked when the Chancellor and the Prime Minister came out the other day and said, you know, we'll, we'll pay for everything here. Don't panic. I can't decide who's been the best First Minister, Alex or Nicola. What does the nation think? Both excellent politicians. Excellent politicians, I think. And... Uh, Mark Tennant's watching, dinky do. Hello, Mark. Lovely to have you with us and a very warm welcome. So there you are. I'm wondering if you're the Mark that I'm thinking of. Uh, when is your next YouTube stream going to be, Scotty? I know, Jack, I've been neglecting YouTube a little bit because I've been concentrating here on uh, Facebook Live, but you'll see why I'm concentrating on Facebook Live. There we are. Mark Tennant, I'm just wondering if I knew your father. Uh, so there we are. But I will go back to YouTube, and I would like every day. There's 700 videos on YouTube, on Scotty McClure's YouTube channel. Everybody should get themselves onto that. There we are. Have we shared? Have we shared? Have we shared? Wonderful. Do a bit more sharing. Let's get a share again. But uh, we had 6,000 watched the other day. I was rather chuffed with that, guys. So there we go. Uh, Howard will not go into that just now. That's not for discussion at the moment. So there you go. Somebody last week was very upset because we couldn't discuss a high-profile case. But the case was still live. And by law, you can't discuss certain things. Hi, Scotty, says Kareem. Uh, uh, this has just shown, and not earlier or anywhere. This is just shown now, and not earlier or anywhere. You, what's that, Kareem? So you'll need to tell, tell me more. I'm not with you. Uh, when this is all over, do you think tax and national insurance and prices of everything will go up? Well, I think they're going to have to find some way to pay for it because this is going to cost like a war would cost, you know. But a war was the opposite in that you had full employment, everybody busy, full churches, 
all these sort of things. Um, but then everybody gets killed in a war, although there are a lot of people dying in this uh, pandemic. If we could get rid of the idiots on YouTube, the streams would be amazing. Well, Jack, this is where I'm heading with it. I'm trying to train some of our younger people who go onto YouTube and go, let's see if we can muck this up. Let's see if we can clown. Let's see if we can be uh, rude and puerile. That's not the way Scotty McClue works. You know, everybody that's watching Scotty McClue should be watching Scotty McClue because that's what they want to do. They want to watch Scotty McClue. Uh, Scotty, just thinking, do you think this crisis could reverse Brexit as it could bankrupt us on our own? Peter Connolly, I've thought this many, many times. Uh, people go, it's too late, we've left. We haven't left. A good lawyer in um, you know, a matter of hours probably could untangle all this stuff. A phone call from a prime minister to say to uh, Europe, um, hi, listen, sorry about all the mucking about and the confusion. Could we do an about turn and come back and join you? And But we would, if we come back and join you, we're talking a really, really good deal for the United Kingdom. Would you be up for that? And if Europe said, yes, I'm sure we can talk. A good lawyer could rescind Article 50, turn that around in no time. So there we are. Um, and could uh, null and void, all that stuff. But you would still have a handful of idiots screaming democracy because of that opinion poll that they let go. That opinion poll was a party political stunt that went horribly wrong, all right? So there was no need for that. You didn't even need to act on it. And it had the same legal value as an opinion poll. And the government of the time said, Stay in the EU. We're advising you to stay in the EU. It will save jobs. It will strengthen our economy, etc., etc. And then we came out of it, you know, and that was madness. Initially, they can't put taxes up because it would further harm businesses. It will need to be gradual. So what you need to do is anybody that did vote leave, you'd have to say, look, we're going to null and void that um, referendum because it was based on stuff that wasn't actually true. We said, if we leave, we'll give 350 million pounds a week to the NHS. Um, have they done that? Will they do that? You know, initially they can't put taxes up. It would further harm businesses. It needs to be gradual. Yes, Gordon Robinson, very good point. Sorry, when you share that you are on, it didn't this time. I've just seen it now. Ah, excellent. I see, Kareem. So everybody's not getting to know. Um, I've always said if we could get to the whole Facebook audience, you know, maybe a, a couple of billion people, that would be fabulous. And we could take calls. Uh, we will all pay for it. Whatever they spend, they'll claw it back through cuts and taxes. Yes, Robert Rovers, but why well, you've got to be careful. We're dealing with a pandemic at the moment. Now, you must have certain standards of health and hygiene. And I was saying at the weekend, this might be a good time, especially with the Prince of Wales testing positive for COVID-19, for uh, COVID virus, uh, coronavirus. This would be a good time to put the prefix royal before the NHS. And of course, all the daft dudes were, oh, 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 you know, the Royal National Health Service, it ups the status. Uh, people on YouTube have, uh, it's too easy to make more than one account. It is Brian Hall. And of course, when you ban the dafties, they're going to make another account. But they were thinking it was funny to put a root name on the account. And so you just have to keep banning them. Um, <clears throat> it could be charged as it was just an advice. It could be changed as it was just an advisory referendum only. It was. There was no need to act on it. And it surprised me that the government acted on it. 
The government didn't want us to leave Europe. Any right-thinking person didn't want us to leave Europe. But a number of us voted leave because we thought it was the right thing to do because the NHS were going to get all this money. <coughs> we fell for it. And they should therefore have nulled and voided it. What they should have said at the end of the referendum is, thank you very much for your vote. We have taken cognizance of it and um, we'll just make adjustments so that we realize there is a lobby that would like to leave. Also remember, there were only 17.4 million voted to leave. There were 16.2 million voted to remain. That's a majority of 1.2 million. There are almost 70 million of us in the UK. So 1.2 million, a lot of it made up of Hooray Henrys, uh, looking for a quick buck, a lot of it made up of xenophobes, ah, we don't want them coming in, you know, that sort of idea, not them, there's them and us. So they played on that vote. So 1.2 million are dictating to almost 70 million people, you know? Now, that 1.2 million, if they'd been thrown under a bus, would it have made any difference? I know everybody was screaming democracy, but what's democratic about proroguing parliament? What's democratic about, um, you know, telling people whoppers? That sort of idea. What's democratic about that? Hello and good morning, Scotty, says Eleanor McKinnon. Hello, Eleanor, dinky do. Welcome to Scotty McClure's pop-up. You'll be off soon. Thank you again, Mr. McClure. See you tomorrow. Gordon Robertson, dinky do. Goodbye, Scotty. Have a great day. The truth is we were lied to during the Brexit debate, so it should be null and void immediately, says Peter. Scotty McClure, what are your plans for today? Oh, fabulous, Kareem. A lot of work today in the house. Um, I think there should be tougher rules against the virus, says Eleanor. Absolutely. Guys, it's been a blast. It's been lovely to be with you. Catch me tomorrow at the same time, God willing, weather permitting. Have a fabulous day. This is Scotty McClure saying dinky-doo to every single one of you. Ta-da, love!